Mr. Piyush Goyal joins us, uh, one of the senior most ministers in the Modi government, Minister for Commerce and Industry. Mr. Goyal, welcome. Uh, the big uh, headline from the budget is this 35% increase uh, in capital expenditure which the government is promising. However, if you look at the numbers in the last year, partly on account of the pandemic, the lockdown, the migrant crisis, the government wasn't able to spend uh, the claims that were made on how much money the government would spend. Now the critical question is, where do you hope to infuse this injection uh, of uh, the capital expenditure? And are you hoping that this will have the multiplier effect which will really kickstart the economy, take it into one gear up? Uh, Rahul, thank you very much. First of all, last year you are well aware that we've had two very serious waves of COVID. The second wave in the first quarter and in the third quarter, the or rather in the fourth quarter, the third wave. So clearly there were setbacks to the investment plans or the amount we could spend. And uh, it's, it's a phenomenon that we saw everywhere, wherever there was labor required, people went away to the villages and different uh, uh, supply constraints, particularly because of the disruption of supply chains worldwide. So, but I think the worst is over. Things are getting more and more normalized. And uh, I do believe that in this current quarter also, we'll be able to make up for what we lost, some of what we lost in January. But next year, using PM Gati Shakti, which is a very powerful tool that has been launched by Honorable Prime Minister, we are very confident that our planning process and execution of these projects will become far more robust. There's also another element. Many CapEx projects or plans have a state government uh, input also on a cost sharing basis in order to support them since last year we found many states not able to put up their share of their uh, of the requirement the honorable finance minister has given a 1 lakh crore rupee 50 year interest free funding to the states for their capex plans or their margin money i think this will also support the efforts to see larger use of the capex uh, provided in the budget in some senses in is this an admission sir that the private sector isn't rising to the challenge when it comes to investment i remember one of the things that you'd said and others had said that we have reduced corporate taxes when corporate taxes were rationalized in the hope that the private sector will now do its part. I remember you were in Mumbai at an India Today conclave and you said that humne apna kaam kiya hai. you were speaking to you know, your friends in industry in Mumbai. That hasn't happened. Even though capacity utilization is in the mid 70s, we're not seeing aggressive privatization by India, uh, aggressive private investment by India Inc. in the India story. Is that why the government feels it needs to step up to the challenge? And are you disappointment, disappointed that private investment hasn't shot up in the way that you'd hoped for? Not at all, Rahul. Now, look at the timelines. September 19 is when we announced the massive tax cuts and the boost to private investment in manufacturing. The, by the time people really reject their plans, make investment plans, you come into January, February, and uh, COVID hits the world. Not only India, it's the world. It's the worst pandemic the world has ever seen. So, obviously, private uh, investments do take a little backseat during a time of uncertainty. And you saw the stock market at that time collapsing. You saw the uncertainty all over the world. So I think uh, I would not blame the private sector at all. It was the times were so bad at that time that soon after our announcements, if things had remained normal by now, we would have seen significant private investment. But unfortunately, the last two years have been COVID years. It is in such periods that government has to step up uh, the investment program, which we have done last year. And this year, a record 35% increase. And state and center together, over 10 lakh crores. When you add the multiplier effect, the multiplier impact will give you a huge demand stimulus or impetus in the market. And that demand, coupled with the fact that you can see imports are also rising, will encourage private sector where they can see demand in front of their eyes and start looking at investments. I want to walk across to the budget intelligence dashboard and ask you about disinvestment. Because if you look at 
the government's target this year for disinvestment in FY23. It's only 65,000 crore rupees. In FY21, the target was 2,10,000 crore. In the next year, the target was 1,75,000 crore, which today was revised to 78,000 crores. Uh, in FY21, we were able to realize only 16% of the disinvestment target. This is less than a third of the target which was set in the last two years. There are two ways of looking at it, Mr. Goyal. One is that the government is being conservative and realistic. The other is that the government has realized that, you know, it, because of uh, the stock markets not being as enthusiastic as they were last year, it will be difficult to raise more than this and therefore don't set high expectations. The other is the government's possibly lost its mojo enthusiasm in trying to push through uh, disinvestment like we saw over the past few months, especially on the back of Air India. Everybody thought, okay, here is a government that's now pushing privatization aggressively. This target doesn't suggest uh, aggressive disinvestment plans. Uh, Rahul, as you might have heard today itself, Nilanchal Ispat yes. announcement was made in the budget. Now, that's a company that MMTC had floated 20 years ago, which had no business. MMTC had no business to be in the steel industry, manufacturing on top of it. So I think this is a government which is steadfast in its commitment. Whatever we have announced, we are implementing. Disinvestment two years ago was planned to be much more aggressive. But as I said just now, COVID came in. And obviously during COVID, one wouldn't have been able to get the best of uh, interest in our disinvestment program. Also, disinvestment entails a lot of background working particularly because these PSUs over a period of time had built up a lot of baggage, which we are trying to clear, segregate the non-core assets and core assets, get the land and building out of the way so that uh, unrealized profits of the company remain with the government and don't go to the new buyer. So a lot of deep thought goes into it. Okay. And therefore, if you will see in both the years, we have now tried to become more realistic not at all lost any mojo. We are completely committed that government has no business to be in the business, many of the businesses that we are there. The Honorable Finance Minister under Prime Minister's guidance had set out a certain roadmap on how public sector enterprises will be either retained in government or uh, will be uh, disinvested. Okay. I think we stand committed to that. You know, stay with me. I have one more final question for you, but I also want to introduce your colleague in the union cabinet, Ashwini Vaishna, who's joining us. We'll speak to him about uh, a lot of what's happening in telecom and railways. I have one more honest question for you, Mr. Goyal, which is to do with exports. Exports now at a decade high. Now, part of this is that on the back of the pandemic, uh, there's been a general increase in global goods trade. The other is because a lot of what you've been doing in government, exports are finally bouncing back. In this quarter, estimates suggest that India's uh, share of global trade could be more than 2%. How sustainable is this increase in exports, in your view, as Commerce and Industry Minister? Final question to you, and then we go to Minister Vaishnav. We just released the figures for export for January. It's one more record, $34 billion of uh, exports in January. Another record, so for 10 months in a row. We've crossed $30 billion of exports. We are now more exports than the highest India had ever done in a full year. So we are well on track to do $400 billion as the Honorable Prime Minister had finalized. But I must share with you, this is not a top-down, uh, top-driven export target only. This came after extensive consultations with the missions all over the world, with exporters, export promotion councils, with industry, and therefore, it's a very inclusive target that we had set. Okay. And uh, that's why the success. We are now in the process of working with industry to set next year's target. Obviously, every year you can't have a 40% growth. But we'll continue to show consistent and steady growth. And that will be the way forward for our export. Well, this on your watch is actually... Uh, quite a significant achievement and it is in India's interest that uh, exports continue to grow in the way that they have. So thank you very much, uh, Minister Goel, for joining us. I want to go across now to Minister Ashwini Vaishnav and I'll focus uh, uh, on 5G. There's an announcement that uh, 5G services are likely to be rolled out in this year. 
the telecom sector has been in financial distress. There's been a lot of concern internally about what these 5G auctions will be priced at, what the government is hoping to fetch. Can you give our viewers a broad sense of your vision to implement 5G services and when will I have 5G on my phone, sir? See, there are two dimensions of the 5G point that you have raised. First dimension is rolling out the 5G services. Second dimension is creating our own entire technology stack for the 5G, um, 5G services. So I'll first address the first point. First point is, so try, recommend, uh, try consultation process is almost in its final lapse. We expect the recommendations to come somewhere in March, uh, coming March. The work on tender process is already in, in parallel, it's going on. So I think we should be able to complete the process by August, uh, September timeline and we should start rolling out, rolling out uh, 5G services by then. The important point is creating the entire technology stack which, which includes the core network, the radio network, the telecom equipment, the entire telecom gear, then the 5G handsets. How do we create that entire system, entire ecosystem within the country? That's what, is a, uh, that's what, in my opinion, is a very important success for our country under Prime Minister Modi's uh, leadership. His vision has been that our technology has to be not only competitive within the country, but tomorrow it should be able to be, we should be able to export this. So the core network which has been developed, it's world class, it's almost a generation ahead of the existing networks. First time we have got success in having our own IPR, Indian IPR, included in the 5G standards. The 5G testbed at IIT Chennai is complete. 35 companies have been included for manufacturing telecom equipment. 5G mobile handset manufacturing has already started. So that, in my opinion, is a very big success because that lays the foundation for creating huge number of employment opportunities going forward. Now, you have so many different portfolios, I'm wondering what ministry should I pick from next, but I'll take uh, IT and telecom. In some senses, uh, those who invest in cryptocurrencies are disappointed that the tax is at 30%. The fact that there should be some taxation on crypto trade is understandable. The fact that it should be taxed at 30% for a lot of millennial investors uh, using a part of their hard-earned money, investing in these crypto uh, assets, this 30% taxation has come as a bit of a shock. Secondly, the government talks of a digital currency to be introduced in this year. The RBI so far doesn't even have a pilot project, so therefore are you confident that India will have some kind of a digital rupee this year? And if it does, how is this digital currency likely to play out? What kind of utility do you see this digital currency have? So, I'll address the second part of the question first. Globally, almost 80 odd central banks are already exploring some form of digital currency. Some countries have already rolled out pilot projects of digital currency. Digital currency is definitely one way of looking at the future and if ultimately it has to be rolled out by the central bank because who's going to control the fiscal policy, who's going to control the monetary policy, how are you going to balance the foreign exchange which comes in the country or goes out of the country. That entire setup has to be done by a central bank only. It cannot be done by a distributed network which is what many people try to attempt. But I think, I think the way our society is structured all over the globe the central banks will have the primary role in having the digital currency. So I'm confident, given the talent that we have, given the uh, maturity of development processes that we have, we will be among the leaders in rolling out a successful digital currency. Okay, stay with me, Minister Vaishnav. I just want to introduce the next set of guests joining us on this broadcast. Rajiv Kumar, Vice Chairperson of the Niti Aayog. We've got Sanjeev Mehta, Chairman Managing Director of Hindustan Unilever. Uh, also, President Fiki at this time, Manish Tiwari joins us for a perspective from the Congress. But I have one final question for Minister Vaishnav on what's being called India's first employment or unemployment rights. We saw in Prayagraj, in Uttar Pradesh, in Gaya, in Bihar, uh, people come out in the streets. Essentially, 
35,281 vacancies, 1.25 crore applicants. It's easier to get into an Ivy League institute than it is to get into the Indian railways. And many in the opposition would suggest that this shows just how desperate the job situation is on your watch. And they're accusing the government, A, of constantly changing uh, criteria and secondly, not creating enough jobs which make young people in poor areas coming from simple families desperate for what is essentially a very low-level government job. So that's where this budget's importance is. It's an investment-led growth, right? If you take the numbers, 7.5 lakh crore capital investment would lead to something like 30 lakh crore investment in the entire economy. That's the multiplier effect. 7.5 lakh crore in the Indian economic structure will create something like 28 to 30 lakh uh, employment opportunities in infrastructure alone. Simultaneously, if you take the PLI, PLI, uh, PLI has already taken off very well as we discussed. That is another huge source of employment. So employment is a very important focus and how to create employment. Ultimately, employment has to be created by having a fresh investment cycle. And that's what government has attempted in the last budget and taken it forward given the success we have had since last year, taken it forward to the next level by announcing 7.5 lakh crore capital investment. This cycle goes on. I'm sure we have a potential to grow at 8 to 8.5%, 8 9%, consistently over next many years. Okay, we'll build on some of these themes later. I have a lot more questions for you, but I'll, I need to let you go. Thank you very much, Minister for Railways, Communication, Electronics and Information Technology. I wonder often how you handle all these different portfolios and juggle all these various very significant uh, ministerial boards.